here today with Duo Dickinson, who is an award-winning architect, also an author, and a teacher. Duo, thanks for being here. It's a pleasure. Great seeing you, even if it's on a little screen. It is great to see you. It's been too long, actually. Right. So wait, um, your most recent book was Staying Put, is that correct? Yep, that's, that's the one that came out about two or three years ago. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, that was uh, in direct response to the economic you know, uh, bubble bursting and people realizing that they couldn't move because they couldn't sell their house, either because they had too much into the house or nobody wanted to buy their house. And we realized that there was a huge reservoir of desire to do something to make a house that isn't necessarily yours, yours. So we created a book in a new way. This is my seventh book. And the way we did it um, was, I would say, pretty successful in that it sold you know, 10,000 copies. But back in the day, you would set, books like this would sell for twenty or 25,000 copies. But that's not true anymore. It's part of the big transition. But in order to make it under $25 um, retail, and you can probably get it on Amazon for $14 or $15, is that you, we used all my projects. And normally in these things, I try to get as many architects in these things as possible on the broadest perspective possible. But I was able to work on a deal with a photographer that's done my work forever. And we were able to get uh, 60, 70 projects in a book for a photo price that allowed it the, the book price to be under twenty five dollars, and that was very important to us. And and there are you know hundreds of photographs in the book. There are sixty or seventy different projects. They're all done on a on a piece basis. So it's about kitchens, it's about entries, it's about living spaces. So it so it's, it's not the Smith project, the Jones project. It's it's basically what people are doing with their houses to make them theirs in a time when there's very limited fluidity fluidity about buying and selling and moving up the the food chain to get a better house by leapfrogging. Now people are predominantly staying where they are and renovating. And even though the construction uh, starts for new homes have ticked up in the last year or two, they're still at one of the lowest levels they've ever been in the last generation. So the record bad year was two years ago. There, were, there was an average of 300,000 new house starts. I think now it's something under... Uh, six or eight hundred thousand, but back in the boom days, it was over two million housing starts a year. So that lack of housing starts really means there are fewer people that want to, um, fewer people that really want to buy anything or can buy anything. There are fewer people employed. It's harder to get a mortgage. More people are in, are, are in debt in the house in a way that they can't pay off the debt when they sell the house. They're underwater. So this was um, the first book that I know of that used an architectural approach to saying you can do more things in your home than maybe you thought you could, and you're not alone. A lot of people like to do things like you do and lead people along, giving them a lot of practical advice. And, the, and this website, this little website called stayingfoot.com, has actually gotten a little bit of traction, very limited, but a little bit of attraction. Um, and the book itself has been very successful, but the problem is that books are changing. So my next project with Taunton Press, I hope, is going to be really much more multimedia and maybe have um, uh, a website as its basis and print-on-demand books and maybe things like this, some sort of video or radio presence. Because the truth is, books that you buy in a bookstore are just not selling. And the same press, it's one of the best presses I think in the world for home books, uh, would do five to eight new books every season, architecture books. Mine was the first one they'd done in two or three years, and they've only done one or two every year for the last two or three years. So they, they're trying to figure out how they can stay in business and make something that approaches a book. And it's because the people in the press are terrific, you really realize that nobody knows what new media is going to be in five years. Mm -hmm. So it's all kind of an exploration. And since we're, you and I are doing this now, and since I have got a pretty good blog, Saved by Design, that seems to be getting a lot of hits on a lot of different topics, and since um, uh, I do, I've do, i done a bunch of radio over the years, 
-hmm. there is kind of this sense that even though nobody's getting paid for anything, there's more information being shared than ever before. So there's a huge flow of information without being compensated for it. And that, that will stop at some point when people start to starve to death. But at least the mechanisms for sharing things are now so free and open that you've got uh, a pretty interesting egalitarian mode of interplay that was never there before. So the traditional architecture magazines have winnowed down to two from like five or six. The shelter magazines have winnowed down to like five or six from like 20 or 30. Um, some websites have come and gone. House, who I write for, is got three million hits, I think, like every week. So it's it's... And yet they're finding it interesting to figure out how do we make money. A wildly popular site, how do you make money? And what advertising can you actually sell? How much can you get for the advertising? It's, yes. This is uncharted territory, so nobody really knows what's going on. The one thing that I have faith in, though, is that, is that having done been an architect for 35 years and built about 600 things, I can say that houses are so fundamental to people's state of being. It's like food. Or clothing. People are always going to eat. They're always going to put, you know, clothing on their back. They're always going to have a place to come home to. And the question is, how many of them are willing to think about their accommodations as a point of pride and, and to manifest where they live as part of who they are? And does that involve professional design help? Well, because it's so expensive to rent or own anything in terms of the percentage of your income, the fact that Almost everybody's got some financial advice. Almost everybody uses a real estate agent. Almost everybody, you know, still goes to some form of store, internet or not, to buy something. It's not direct barter or self-help. You don't build your own automobile. There's probably a role for architects and design in homes for the future. And I don't know about architects and other and other aspects, but food, shelter, and clothing are the big three. And so if architects can make where you spend your money better, even if you spend a little bit of money on architects, to me, there's a future there. Did people, well, I could ask you a lot of questions based on everything you just said. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that people use some of your ideas from your book, Staying Put? I hope so. I mean, I do know that you, know, you get a lot of fan mail. A lot of people tell, tell me that what, what I think they find the most interesting is that because I've done so many of these projects, there's so many different families, what ends up happening is they see themselves in the projects and it validates the fact that you know, maybe I really don't need a front door, maybe I don't really need a formal dining room, maybe I really should have an outdoor space that is as aesthetically developed as any indoor space in my house. Maybe it's okay if I take down these three walls that get in my way, maybe it's okay if I put a new window wall here because I've got this great view, maybe it's okay if I add a small addition because that will enable me to bring my parents' home to live. Maybe it's maybe it's okay if I have a very small space for my home office that I can hide away from other people. I don't need a room anymore because right now you and I are, you know, conversing across the continent on tiny pieces of electronics. <laughs> so, so my you know, my sense is that it's a scary transition for many people not to have these huge wads of capital that banks are willing to throw at houses so that you could you know, buy, sell, and trade because they always assume that houses are going to get more and more valuable no matter how bad they were or no matter how much money you didn't put down on them. Um, the houses are so essential that over time they will stabilize. But I can tell you for a rock solid fact that this kind of a six year now, this six year period of economic uncertainty or maybe even just economic depression is really unprecedented in the last yeah. since the depression, since the actual Great Depression, and it's thrown um, the construction industry and the architecture industry I into a tizzy. They, the happy talk is no longer no longer valid. You can't really say, "Oh, it's going to be better next year." Oh, I got these great clients. I mean, we have plenty of work in the office. We have forty or fifty projects, but I probably made less money being an architect this year than I have in the last ten or fifteen years. Because we have work, but the work a lot of it's pro bono or a lower cost for not for profits or very small jobs where I can't charge a fee I can for a larger job. Because mm -hmm. my goal is to build things, it isn't to get rich. But what it boils down to is, you know, free market economies tell you what people value. 
And right now they're not valuing design services like they were 10 years ago. They're not valuing homes as investments as they were 10 years ago. But then the question is, what will happen two, three, five years from now? Will, will there be a paradigm shift? Wait, well, I mean, no why, one knows. Well, let me ask you, why not do you think? Why do you think they're not valuing that? As they did, because of economics, mostly? Totally That's economics. In other words, the market was so distorted and so overblown. Things, things, the, the, the value of properties were so outstripped what they were actually worth in the real world that there had to have been a boomerang effect. Things had to come back down to earth. I don't think anybody understood, and I really do fault architects for this, by the way. I don't think anybody truly understood just how overblown and overheated the market was. I mean, when I would give talks in nineteen in two thousand and five, six, seven, I give talks about housing. I talk about how so many homes were being built that were thoughtless and too big and undesigned and poorly built. Mm -hmm. I get sort of blank stares from from a lot of architects and people in the construction industry because they're saying, "Well, we're building lots of houses, we're making lots of money. Why? How could that be wrong?" Well. Not that many architects did that. Many architects just surfed that wave, got as much work as they could, and hoped it would, it would keep going. But you know, if a doctor you know feels a lump in your breast, he, for him not to say this is really serious, you should get this checked out. It's the same thing as an architect saying you're paying two million dollars for this house. It's maybe worth half that. And I would say that to people, and I get these blank looks. But the architecture industry didn't have the guts to basically be the people that spoke the truth. I mean, there, there's no ethic in the architecture community like there is to have, you know, doctors without borders or uh, lawyers, uh, pro bono lawyers for indigent clients. There's no, there's no um, ethic of going for a higher purpose other than getting what you fantasize as being beautiful built. And that usually means most architects don't listen to clients much. Most client architects don't think about how much things cost as long as they can get it built much. So the fact that right now architecture still has probably the highest unemployment rate of all of the licensed professions, which are doctors and lawyers and engineers and architects are the four professions that really get licensed by the state because they involve life safety issues and health and welfare. That, because we have at least... 40% under or unemployment, under or unemployment, we are in a terrible place. And there are many people who have said uh, that the, and I, anecdotally, and I haven't seen too much to, to dissuade me from the anecdotes, that kids coming out of school, there are very, very few jobs for kids coming out of architecture school, and there's a record number of architecture school graduates. And because the schools larded up, People go to school when they can't get a job sometimes, so they lard it up with grad students, lard it up with undergrads. They're all coming out and they're all becoming baristas because there's really not a lot of work out there when a 30-year professional will work for the same compensation as somebody right out of college just to keep busy. So it's a very, very strange time. And um, one of the blog posts I wrote was, was, was called The Uncertainty We All Feel, and that was a quote from a national magazine's editor who didn't want to be attributed because we were talking amongst a group of about four or five of us about doing some kind of program together. And the, the gist was nobody knew what the hell was going on. Nobody knew what the future was, and everybody was kind of depressed about it. The cascade of comments that I got from that, and one in particular that I put as a, as a, as a PS to that by... Rory Pezaninsky, who's an old client of mine, who's deeply involved in branding and marketing. There is kind of this, I think, a, a sense of uncertainty that we haven't seen in sort of the culture really since the Industrial Revolution, where you went from subsistence farming to, you know, leaving your home to go to work in a factory or somewhere in a shop. So th this is a gigantic change because technology is taking over so much of what used to be uh, personal and actually analog. The digital world of things happening all the all at the same time and being searchable all at the same time. There's really no beginning, middle, or end. It's all data all the time, instantly accessible without filters. When that happens, it disrupts what the confidence people have in their day-to-day -day lives so that they can actually earn a living. And I think that pulls people in. And we don't have the confidence that generated 
after the Industrial Revolution got established and you had factories and there was a, there was a marketing system and you could buy a Model T and you could you know, buy this little tiny house on a small piece of land and you're in your city in the 20s or you know, the teens. That all went away. I mean, that all, that all happened after people got used to the Industrial Revolution. We're in the middle of the, the technological revolution and I don't think people really have adapted to where it, the way they look at the world. I don't know too many people that are saying, wow, I'm having a great time. The future looks terrific. It's, you know, it's more mostly, gee, I'm doing okay. I seem to be making enough money. It's okay. You know, it's, it's sad because I've seen three or four construction companies locally here in Connecticut who will plenty okay construction companies simply cease to exist. I've seen any number of architects cease to exist or, or partner with other architects who are having financial troubles. And if you talk to lawyers, they're not hiring too many people. If you talk to doctors, they feel terrified of all of the future that's in front of them. You know, it's 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 an extraordinarily uncertain time. Wow, I mean, that is really that was really well said. So you said there's still a lot of people though going to architecture school. I know, record number. And why do you think that is? Because it's just it's an art. Do you still do you, is. It, I actually think I actually think that that whoever figured out how to market architecture as this uh, heroic combination of art, science, culture, history, um, creativity, hubris, uh, <laughs> all of this wonderful stuff—the ego and the, the, the sort of doing real things in the fine arts world—that whole idea that you could do tangible, real, beneficial things in the fine arts world. Um, it's so seductive to so many people. They want to be able. They all want to be kind of artists, but they want their artist art to matter, and they want to have a job where they could go to be an artist. If you truly are an artist, you're in a studio and you're making stuff, and people buy it or they don't buy it. You could say, "Well, I'm an artist. As an architect, I can make beauty, and I'm part of a larger corporate reality of a firm that does buildings that people want. They're built. You know, everybody has to have a building." So that's all true, but what's happened with this technological revolution is you need fewer people to do the work of drawing things, and secondly, the people who are drawing things aren't necessarily architects. They're not even necessarily in the same hemisphere. They're places that draw big buildings halfway around the world in a hive of you know drafting companies. They're people that are not licensed architects that can produce a set of drawings that are every bit as compelling as the one licensed architects are. And so the idea of being a licensed architect that goes to architecture school and gets tested and vetted out is beginning to gain traction. Let me ask a quick. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but how does that happen that someone can produce something that's equally as compelling as something that a licensed architect could produce? Uh, mostly because the architects have lost control of the profession. We, 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 what, what is happening now? And this is a huge issue. And and, and you know, I do write about it in the blog, Save by Design, and I also have a guy named a good friend named uh, Curtis Wayne who also um, has written about this uh, and many other blogs do too by the way it's, it's a it's a it's one of the it's a problem without a solution is that essentially now the vast majority of people that teach architecture have built almost no buildings the, the vast majority of people that build buildings aren't allowed to teach when I was going to architecture school in a five-year program, and now that's kind of a dinosaur, they still have five-year programs that are kind of a hybrid masters and bachelors together. Uh, there were many practitioners that would teach you about designing a building. So there was always an edge of reality to what you're being taught. More and more people, more and more programs, in fact, they've outlawed bachelor of architecture programs that are really only allowing, um, only, only allowing masters of architecture programs to be initiated now. Those master's programs are populated by academics, mostly. Academics who have a, either an, a master's or a PhD in architecture. And I was sitting at a, I was sitting at a, having lunch in a great place in New Haven, and a former dean of Yale's architecture school is sitting next to me, and we're all friendly because we're all old. Mm -hmm. And basically, um, he said, I'm terrified that the degree that will be used to obtain an architecture license which used to be a Bachelor of Architecture, morphed into a Master's of Architecture, and become a PhD in Architecture, because the academic industrial complex wants jobs for academics, and will set the bar not at how nice a building you can make, or ethical building you can make, but how many years of instruction you've had. And so instead of being a profession that used apprenticeship as a way of actually learning about architecture, they use education within 
an internship. And that's a big difference. It used to be that you could actually apprentice for seven years and take the license exam and never go to college. That's in some states that's possible, but pretty much not in most states. And so the it it you know architecture is caught between two worlds, caught between the nineteenth century world of being an apprentice in a trade and a twenty late I'd say mid twentieth century world of the fine arts being uh, promulgated in buildings where the focus on how things work and are built and what they cost is almost non-existent in many academic programs and the, the sort of fig leaf for that, the thing that sort of makes people feel like they are not they are in touch with what people, with something greater than just art is the sustainable green movement which is one of the larger frauds you know ever because what it does is it takes very common sense things about buildings should be efficient and they should we should reuse materials and we should fit into the landscape and they should be as small as possible and they should really think about what they will how they will be in 30 or 40 years in terms of the weathering and use factors and flexibility they take all those factors they're always part of architecture and they put them in a subset so then a whole other crew of professionals can charge as consultants to create that so that that whole green movement over to the side, that sustainability movement, where you've got leads, you know, there's that whole lead rating system you've probably heard of, which you know, there's silver, platinum, gold lead rankings, and a person comes in and for forty thousand dollars will analyze your building and give you a status and say you are a silver lead platinum or whatever building. That ends up being as important as does the building leak. And, and the truth is, uh, if, if a building leaks, it's not a building anymore, it's a sculpture that you happen to be inside of. But the, and a good example is there's a building in the University of Connecticut campus whose leaks were so horrific that they've had to fire the architect, fire the roof consultant, and everybody's suing everybody because in making a building that they thought was cool, they really didn't think about how to get the water off the building, which is the fundamental job one of the building. But because you're not lauded for having a water type building, you're lauded for having a really cool shape that you can see in a photograph. The lauding of that, the award winningness of that, has pushed over to the side the value of usefulness in architecture. And, and the, practicality, you know, just being right. practical. Well, just being, I, mean, I, I even see it as being, I would even make it even less, I, I, I make it actually, practicality would say, well, that's an engineer's job, or that's a that that's a uh, you know, that that's a good carpenter's job. Okay. But it's 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 more that that architects are trained. That doesn't mean they do, because there are many of us that really care about everything. They are trained to value themselves predominantly on the aesthetic innovation of what they're doing. They want to have something that's never been done before. That's got a real interesting point of view that when you do photograph it, or now take a video walkthrough of it, it will blow people's minds. It is virtually the same as the fine arts world or the fashion world, where things are skating on thrills versus being deeply enriching and thoughtful. And and what's, what's odd for me is, because I've done this for so long and I've won a lot of awards and I'm part of, you know, a lot of different larger, older mechanisms, if you do buildings now, I mean, a good example, about 10 years ago, I did a building that was pretty pretty juicy, pretty sexy. <laughs> and I said, you know, I, I won when I was 31 years old. I won something called an architectural record award for my own house, which is the highest award you can win in residential science. It's like a super amazing, like winning an Oscar. And so I was very young, and I won this Oscar-like award. And times changed. Buildings ceased to be what ceased to think about water and materials and became more like sculptures and very, very sculptural. So I literally said to an editor there that I've known for 25 years, I sent him a, a one-sentence email with no pictures. I said, I have a house, mostly wood, with a pitched roof. Any chance for this record house award? He sends me back email immediately. Probably not. Never seeing it, never understanding it, never thinking about it, because it's become a binary. If basically, if, if the thing looks like something that's been done before, it's not as good as something that hasn't been done before. Now, I like things that haven't been done before. I like innovation. I like sculpture. I like all this kind of stuff. 
The problem is that when you skew an entire profession over to the radical fringe, which you can make a direct case that is happening in politics, it's happening in many things. When you go to the radical fringe, extreme side of anything, and you basically say that's what we should do as a mainstream of our profession is this radical fringe thing that appeals to a tiny segment of the world, you then marginalize your your value to people. You become irrelevant. And what's what's happening in architecture is some of us are extremely important to a very small group of people and are completely unimportant to very many, many, many people. And we're becoming less important because what we do involves so much cost. And unless we can show that like, you can listen to your clients, that you think about money, and you're still innovative, you, unless you can think of those things, you're not worth very much to people. Because people want, especially in houses, they want to know that you are making their house, not your house but a house that would be better than they could make on their own you know, on any level, whether it's leaking or whether it's weathering or whether it's, or whether it's just beauty or whether it's like the wow factor or master planning or sustainability or any of these different things. And the problem with the human condition, I find, is that we tend to always make choices that limit our level of thought about things other than we care about. So you know, whether, it's, whether it's in politics and you basically say that you know, Barack Obama is a Muslim mole or, 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 or conversely, you think that essentially the, the Tea Party people have all been lobotomized and, and want to, you know, to kill, kill all of us. These radical, freaky, snarky you know, trolls that are everywhere making everybody feel sort of like they can't say a word about what they believe in the political world. Those radical extremes are enhanced by the medium that you and I are working on right now. The, the, the okay. fact that you know that you can, you can you can anybody can type a comment to anything anybody says anywhere with the same level of gravitas as the president of the United States or as somebody on the street that basically has a has a you know a, a, a smartphone in their hand. There's no there's no filtering. There's there basically it's whoever wants to say anything the loudest will get heard. And in architecture right now, the loud voice is one of sculpture of sex appeal and making something that is controversial and interesting and unprecedented. The other voices of practicality, of listening to clients, craft, context, fitting in with the neighborhood, those voices are not as important. And what's happened is that, that, that things are splitting off into camps where you've got a, group, a whole group of wonderful architects that do nothing but traditional classical architecture. And that's what they do. It's almost like a religious fervor of doing traditional classical architecture. You've got another group of architects who do nothing but technological stuff. And they actually do very techno uh, consulting services about you know integrating technology in buildings. And then you've got a lot of architects that are kind of halfway caught between just having enough money to eat and and working in an office somewhere because you know not everybody wants to have their own office. What ends up happening is not too many great buildings get built. And in a, and in a recession like this Fewer and fewer architects can work, and many fewer are working full time. So it's 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 we are kind of the canary in the cave. We're the kind of least important and most significant of those professions. So as we kind of are inherently leading because we're building. So when you build something, you're obviously going to you're you're, you're looking at the future when you build anything. The future that is uncertain means that what architects do is uncertain, and that when there's uncertainty and a lack of courage. You build less, and architects are needed less. And when they put themselves out on an island of of innovation that has that is out of touch for most people's understanding of what they do and what they can give for you, that makes you verging on irrelevance. So the reason why I write these books and I do things like this with you and I you know, have the blog is that I want to show that there are architects that listen, that can talk human language as opposed to architects speak, that can actually think about cost and how things get put together as opposed to having a beautiful picture of a project that maybe never got built, but because you know computer-generated graphics are so good, it sure does look like it was built, and it might as well have been built. So, and it, I will tell you, I get an enormous amount of flack for it. I, uh, people don't really want to address what I'm s saying to them. And you know, there are a group of us that feel this way, so it isn't just you know, a cranky old duo somewhere in the corner. It is basically that my profession is changing, and I want somebody, I want my grandchildren to be architects if they want to, you know, and, and I don't know if they will be able to be architects 40 years from now. Because, wait, because 
So do you think then, it sounds to me like the trend toward someone having to go to get their PhD to become an architect, I mean, yeah. if that, is that where the trend is going? Do you, would you say well, that? Well, that's, that's, what, that's what people are fearing of my generation. The boomer generation says, you know, yeah. a, about a minority of us, but a significant minority got our degrees as a Bachelor of Architecture degree, and a majority got Masters. The, right. the greatest generation before me, Almost everybody did a bachelor of architecture degree and did not get a master's. And they got generation before that, yeah, and the other before that, they did apprenticeships. Now, because there's so there are no new bachelor programs allowed to get a license mm -hmm. from, that the only new programs are masters. And there's a group of academic architects that say, you know, you can't possibly learn everything in in four years of an of an undifferentiated you know, liberal arts uh, education or fine arts education. And then just three years of graduate school, we need to have six or seven years to get a PhD. Well, that just means we need to have more professors. More years equals more professors. And, and how do those people ever make money, Duo? Because they already they, they, <laughs> they're selling. It's like a drug dealer. What you're basically saying is, you know, I know that you know, I know that when when you're taking this drug, you only feel good. You're not doing good. But it feels so good when you're pretending to be doing good. So you know, if you if you go to a rave and you take Molly to your eyeballs explode, you're gonna feel great during the rave. But at the end of the day, you're still a lousy dancer. So <laughs> so, so, so so the thing is that that when you're a lousy dancer and you take Molly to basically feel good about yourself, all it does is you feel good about yourself. So when you're in architecture school and you're doing buildings on video screens that you print out on hang on a wall, you have the simulation of creating something that's tangible. And you feel good about that. The problem is that when you get out of architecture school, nobody wants to pay you for doing that. And nobody wants to pay you unless you know how to work with engineers, builders, cost, materials, zoning codes, all these enormously creeping into the building process things, which weren't there 30 or 40 years ago. The building code today is four times larger than it was 50 years ago in number of pages. Why? Why but, is that? Uh, because because all of our culture is about minimizing risk. So that if you minimize risk, you do that with regulations. So the more you define things in regulations, the less people have uh, have a fallback to sue you. So so when you've got insurance companies that are extremely into minimizing their risk. Codes around hurricane proofing buildings have gone stratospheric. And especially in Connecticut, we just had a new building code come in that is the equivalent of Florida 20 years ago. So think about that for a minute. We've had a few hurricanes, nothing like Andrew, but it's gone insane. So, and now we have a, a, any number of aesthetic review boards like uh, what are called village districts, design districts, where people will rule on if your building looks okay. Zoning codes have gotten incredibly sophisticated where it isn't just setbacks and coverage, it's it's called floor area ratios that limit the amount of floor area you have. It's it's interactive um, determinations of what parts of your site count towards how big your building can be. If it's too steep or too wet or too rocky, that will on your site, it'll decrease the amount you can build on your site. So and then you have this huge overlay now of energy codes that now basically regulate. So what ends up happening is all the things that were that were ethically that were the ethical imperative of good architects are now being from the inside of who they are are now being applied outside of what the architect does in his or her brain and works their way into the buildings from the outside. So you're put in a position of trying to deal with codes and the idea of making good building is less important than satisfying the code. Back in the day, with really good architects, they'd want to do a good building. Whether it met code or didn't meet code, it would go beyond code. And because they wanted to do the right thing, and they knew how to build buildings. When, you know, the, the Empire State Building was built without a building permit. It was built because they had fought, they figured out a way to make steel stronger than it had ever been before, thought about how to make the techniques work, and hadn't gone through the New York State Legislature as a, as a, as a building material strength designation that could actually be uh, put into the building code and they went ahead and built it anyway because they knew that it was good. They got their they got their certificate of occupancy, but they got the building permit like with two or three months left to go in the building process. It's because they knew how to build buildings. Now it's more defendable, it's more about te technological uh, integration. It's not about people taking things seriously and getting the deep background knowledge to actually work with 
people who know how to build things. It's it's become like medicine. It's become unbelievably split into different differentiated bits and pieces. There are consultants everywhere. I mean, that project I talked about in Connecticut with roof leak, there was actually a hired roofing consultant in the design process. So instead of an architect knowing how a roof goes together, so he designs the building from the get-go to make the roof work with the building, you design the building, then you call in a roofing expert, or in some cases a building skin consultant, and they look at your design, they don't want to change your design, they go, okay, how do I make this thing kind of work, sort of. So you have this disconnect between the design process, how it's built, how much it costs, and how it fits into a community, and nobody's happy with the architect at the end of the day. And but so you went and so, can you yeah. do all those things, Duo? Well, at the level of a house, I can. But the truth is that in large architecture offices that do um, bigger buildings, it used to be that the architects in house would do I don't know seventy, eighty percent of what you had to do. They would maybe hire a, a, a structural engineer. They would maybe hire a mechanical engineer. And as a package, you'd send the drawing out. Now you have to have uh, a lead consultant to do the sustainability part. You have to have the, the skin consultant to do the, 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 the siding of the building. You need to have a roofing consultant. You need to have, so you bring in all these consultants to do these pieces and parts. What ends up happening is the architecture end of things becomes just, just the fine arts design of the shape and spaces. And there isn't any kind of integration between shape, space, structure, material, context, it just becomes abstract design, and, it, and it's basically becoming less and less relevant and understood by the public that architects can actually mean something to them. So I, have, you know, I never wanted to do large buildings, so what I ended up doing was being a house guy, and when you're a house guy, if you get people and you know how to build things, you can make really wonderful homes for people. But you have to be willing to listen to them. You have to be willing to kind of see the house through their eyes and at the same time trust that people can value what you do so that you can actually take what they want and make it into something better than they could have made for themselves. That kind of human interaction is not what school is about. It's also not what, to be honest, what apprenticeship is anymore in the architecture profession. It's not about how we get you know, these ridiculously, we have, we, have to take, we have to take these courses to keep ourselves you know, professionally uh, certified. Mm -hmm. No courses deal with client contact. No courses deal with cost. You know, very few courses deal with the craft of what wood will do with metal or glass will deal with concrete. What they deal with is window systems, flooring systems, this system, that system, because what ends up happening is manufacturers pay money or charge money for you to actually take the course. So it's a profit engine for the local AIA chapter, for the local wind distributor, they use it as a marketing vehicle for their products, and it's you know, and so you end up having this huge disconnect between what architects should be, as they should be, ma they should be master builders like they were in the Renaissance, that know how buildings go together, that now today listen to clients that can have some sense of what ethically what things actually cost, and give give the the client a clue as to what they're what their desires will translate into for money. Those skills are not what is valued in school. Mm -hmm. So those skills of human interaction, craft, how actual materials go together, um, context, what a, what a community values and, and, and how your building should respond to that as opposed to just basically giving it the finger. By the way, there is a new school of art a type of architecture they're calling the FU school, by the way. They're actually, they're, they're, it, 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 it is, it, it, I never heard of it before until I saw a building that literally somebody said, oh yeah, that's, that's the middle finger school of architecture. Because it basically put a tiny house in a community that was like a spaceship, and the idea was deal with it. So everybody, all the people around it, just deal with it. It's art, deal with it. And that's why, you know, that's why I write these things and give these lectures and things because unless somebody says it out loud when it all collapses I would feel like I hadn't done what I needed to do and if it, if if more enough architects say time out time out we can be relevant to people but we have to change the way we're being educated licensed trained 
unless there are more of us are going to do that, then woe on us. It isn't the fact that, that, that a, you know, a ignorant bourgeois culture has rejected the truth and the light and the way. It's that basically we have decided our profession wasn't worth changing to survive. So. Do you feel like sort of a lone wolf, though? Do you have other no. people, you have architects yeah. with you that are saying the same thing? Same thing. Same thing. Actually, you know, there, there are hundreds of people like me. I'm kind of a bloviating jackass, so I basically am happy to talk <laughs> and write and, you know, do all this kind of stuff. More, there, there, are few, there are very few people that are as kind of unafraid of looking like a fool as I am. So most people keep, keep it more to themselves. But the truth is, everybody in the profession knows right now, whether you believe anything I said or not about the aesthetic issues, everybody knows the profession is in deep, deep duty right now. It's in real trouble because people, there are no jobs. People that are in jobs are getting paid less. There's less building going on and less building with architects going on with less building going on. So you have engineers, consultants, people that don't have architecture degrees creating more and more and more buildings because it's cheaper, easier, and more direct. And the architect becomes a supernumerary and becomes like a fashion designer. I mean, the Yale School of Management just opened their building last week and has Sir Norman Foster as his architect, and he's literally a star architect. He's a worldwide, goes, goes to, you know, places where the Queen of England is, and, you know, is, is just a celebrated, you know, human. He's, he's like a, he's a rock star. So, you know, in music, there are probably... 1% of all musicians are rock stars or in the you know, New York Philharmonic or whatever. There are 99% of the musicians that are just playing. Well, that's the same thing with architecture. The problem is you, know, you, you pay a musician to make nice music because the, you pay for that with a $90 or $125 ticket to the Met or a $50 ticket to the you know, Cincinnati Orchestra. You pay it on a piecemeal basis to do a building you know, yeah. you've got to come up often with tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. So if the buy-in for an architect is, I trust this architect to listen to me and to spend my money wisely, but I'm risking a hundred million dollars, and this architecture profession is not good at listening, you'd be a fool to basically trust that this profession will do what you want to do. So you bring in other people to cover yourself, other consultants, other vetting things and architecture becomes less and less and less a leadership profession and more and more of a responsive adaptive profession and what that really says is that what, what we have to offer is less and less rele relevant to people. So I feel that you know I feel I feel that the profession's at a place that is as, about as bad as medicine you know medicine is in a terrible place too. Yes, so, it is. so, and we don't. No one knows. No one knows what the. Uh, no one knows what the future of any of these professions are. So we're not alone. It's just that we're caught in a bad place because we're in a fine arts world that's relatively unnecessary. You know, people are still going to go to the hospital when they have a heart attack. People are still going to go to a lawyer when they get arrested. People are still going to go to engineers when they need a bridge not to fall down. They don't necessarily have to go for an architect for anything. So unless you can prove competence and relevance, it's hard to get people to use you. But has it been like a satisfying career for you? Oh, for me, it's it's literally I can't do anything else. I mean, I have 40 or 50 clients at any given time. Uh, because of the Internet, truthfully, they see the work that I do on, on my website or read mm -hmm. my work that I do. So they know me before they hire me, whether or not they've ever met me or not. So the truth is that it's, it's an effect. The, the beauty of what's the, what the technology affords you today is to create affinity groups immediately so that mm -hmm. so more people can find out who you are. And so even in a terrible economy, we have work. And even in a terrible economy, I haven't missed a payroll, and I still have as many people working for me as I did five or ten years ago. But the truth is, it's uncertain. It's uncertain. So, you know, I've probably actually built over 200 freestanding homes. I've probably built over 400, 300 renovations, and I've probably done 50 or 100 institutional or housing projects. And they're all interesting. They're all different. I've maybe in those 600 clients, I've probably had 10 that I don't like. Maybe 10 that were disingenuous. You know, so that's an amazing. Re you know, that 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 is an amazing ratio of people that you. You, you like. I mean, we're on the we're on this together because you met me what four or five years ago. And we yeah. liked each other. 
Yeah. And the reason was that we shared values, and even though nothing got built, we knew that we shared values. Well, buildings are the are the most seminal way human beings convey their values to each other, especially houses. They're at the core of who we are yes. as families. And if you're a good architect, they're at the core of who you are as an architect. So that life of sharing values with families, it's I couldn't do anything else. I this is what I this is it's what I was born to do. So it's not even an issue. It's it's like breathing for me. Because I felt like you could make my house my home. You would be able to look at us and our life and say, uh, you know, and make that vision possible. And that's yeah. what you have done for a lot of people, wouldn't you say? I hope so. I mean, we we seem to get, you know, we build about eighty percent of what we start. And when you deal with it with an architect that tries to do new and different things and in shaky economies, that's most architects that aren't just plan factories that produce a cape or a ranch or a, a McMansion. Mm -hmm. You're actually rethinking about the site and the client every single time and designing from scratch. And your fees are some something you know maybe a little less than 10% of the construction budget, but typically around 10% of the construction budget. When you have to charge that much money to to design something, to only have 20% not happen, and a lot of that happens because of divorce, or some of it happens because of financial setbacks, or occasionally it happens because we don't anticipate the costs correctly. Mm -hmm. That's enormously different than the 50% that get built that is true of almost every other architect that I know. But one out of two projects for most architects that aren't just plant factories do not get built. Wow. And since we do about 80%, you must be doing something right. And you know, I, I imagine that in boom times, I made a lot less money than the guys that were riding the wave. Right now, I'm probably making more money than guys that are working as baristas. But the truth is, I know that last week I lost a job because my fees that haven't changed in ten years were too high for the person because they found somebody who could get do the do a similar guy to do the work for less. Mm -hmm. So that becomes an issue. Do I now reduce my rates? I don't know. I don't think I can. I do a lot of work for free for not for profits. Um, so you know, thank God my kids are getting out of college because now we have no money left to pay for college. But now the college is paid for, so there we are. So let me ask you, who are some of your inspirational, the architects that you are inspirations to you? Well, I probably have never heard of them, but I'd like to know who they are and why you like well, them. There's only, there's only one that I would truly ask people to look at, and he's had a couple books written about him, and he's, a, he's on your side of, the, of America. And <laughs> Bernard, he's on, his name was, he's dead now, it was Bernard Maybeck. And Bernard Maybeck really was based in Oakland, California. And you could make a case that he was kind of part of the arts and crafts movement like Green and Green, but he was more than that. He was a classic genius kind of guy. He had ideas. He would t he did this thing called bubble crete, where he would take concrete. But in concrete back then was like uh, was was there like carbon fiber, you know, products today. It's super cutting edge, freaky, wild, like concrete. Oh my God, this is amazing stuff. And he, he took the lead in making houses and buildings out of concrete back in the turn of the century. In fact, he was the one that created that amazing, um, it was in theory temporary, but for the uh, San Francisco World's Fair, he did that amazing sort of temple of, of the arts that's in, that's in the San Francisco Harbor. Amazing colonnades with these incredible sculptures. So sort of weirdly neoclassical, but really not. He, he also did... He also did um, uh, several, uh, several houses that were complete out of concrete for his for his kids. He did a, a, a church in in um, did a church in in Oakland that's amazing. So if you Google him, you look up Bernard Maybeck, M A Y B E C K, and you, you just read about him. What is a, what's what I think is incredible is that he was also an incredibly great guy. Everybody liked him. His children loved him. They actually ended up they, you know the, he had he had a good life. He lived to be about ninety. Won every award he could win. And yet, stayed in Oakland, was part of the community, donated his services to people, and was part of a community, part of a family, and was a happy guy. You look at Frank Lloyd Wright. The line that he said that I haven't been able to find on the internet, but I swear to God, I read it in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. <laughs> he was, and I'm probably making it up, but if I did make it up, I think it's probably true. The line that is the the the, the, the flip side of Bernard Maybeck's kids loving him and being with him when he died was, you know, I. Frank Lloyd Wright said, I wished I'd loved my children as much as I loved some of my buildings. 
and it was this stark idea that somehow he lived his life, his profession, and he happened to have children over here. And you know, he was not a happy, he was not a nice man. And I think people that are typically that nasty aren't very happy. Mm -hmm. So there's a quality of, of him that is this sort of, I'm a genius, get out of my way. Bernard Maybeck was a genius. He said, I'm a genius, let's have fun. So, you know, it, does, it breaks the paradigm of, of the fine arts freak architect that is like the fashion designer. Who you don't know what's going to happen when he or she does something, but you want to get out of their way to let them be the genius. You know, and and you know what? Sometimes it works fabulously well. Sometimes these incredibly out of touch architect people make buildings that are incredibly great and they're wonderful buildings. But for the vast majority of humans, they want to have an architect that they want to work with them, where they let them into their lives. They don't. The architect doesn't keep them out of their lives. He, the architect brings them into his life so he can understand or she can understand what they're all about. And you know that's why. I think part of the, the hope for architecture lies in residential work because people will always want to have a, the best home they can and if you can prove your utility to people with smaller projects, um, direct working directly with uh, uh, towns and builders to show you usefulness and are creative, you can actually make everything better and maybe make a, a small living on the side. So it's I think well, houses are balance, different. Balance, right? Though, when you're talking about that architect, he had a he had a balance in his life, and he sort of had a um, a, a purpose to his life that was maybe even greater than just his art. Although his art was part of it, it wasn't so consumed by it. I think some artists can be narcissists too. Mm. They don't have like a healthy sort of <laughs> overall. Maybe well, I would say that you know, it, it, the weird thing is that every, I think you think about it in sort of Zen terms. You know, everything's a balance. The question is, is the balance a happy balance or an incredibly skewed balance and my sense is that for architects that are trained in a fine arts world the idea that somehow people don't understand what I do and when they don't like what I do it's because they're wrong and I'm right which is really if you read the fountainhead that's that's the, that is the ethos versus saying I have a way of looking at things and part of that includes people but also includes where you live and I would even say larger which is more disturbing includes materials like other than white stuff that gets somehow sculpted and involves in wood and steel and glass and stone and dirt and, but involves things that you touch and feel when you ex when you narrow it down to just dealing with sculpture which is what the vast majority of of, of the celebrated architects are doing right now the ones that are in the magazines and being celebrated in the media when it just becomes sculpture it can be phenomenally great sculpture and wonderful buildings for a tiny, tiny, tiny client base. So the truth is, if, if, if part of success is showing more usefulness, you have to have balance because you've got more design inputs. And one of those design inputs is money. And the vast majority of architects think of the client as an ATM machine, and they'll pay for it because they'll, they'll value it. I do it the other way around. I say, how much money do you have? Let's design to the money, and I'll show you every opportunity in the world to break the budget and spend more money, but also year what I'm the basis of what I'm doing with the money you told me you want to spend. So I'm happy if people double the budget. I'm not happy if the budget I assume is double their budget. So there's no reason not to have people overspend if they get inspired, but there's but it's crazy to assume that they will pay more for something because you think it's cool. That's kind of the architect's modus operandi, and in a bad economy. There's no none of this sort of like you know build you know, building frenzy that that excuses it. So my sense is that it's it's we're kind of in a hell position right now. We are architects can't get out of their own way to show usefulness. And at the same time, the economy isn't giving them a break by people thinking that architects could be useful to make money off of, like they did back in the housing boom. And my sense is that with an absent absent that that either being a useful tool for other people to make money or being useful in a very essential way about making a building that doesn't you know fall down and look terrible or rain you know let the rain in absent those sort of two sides of the equation we're caught in a place where um, as I said maybe my grandchildren can't be architects well, so I want to ask you because you brought it up did you read the fountainhead I'm sure you did oh yeah sure I did 
<laughs> and it, you know, it's 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 kind of a night. It's a poorly written book, and it's and it's 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 it actually. Wait, did you say it was poor? Wait, did you say it was poorly written? Yeah, it's, if you ever read it, it's it's. You're it's not sound, a fan it, of hers. Uh, but it, the, the 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 language is has nothing to do with the humanity involved. She's it, whatever Rand writes, it's all about the ideas, it's not about the people. So it's it's put in the it's put in the form of a novel, but it's really a political treatise, you know. So when I was reading it, I'm going like, well, why not just say that the individual is the paramount concern of all of our culture, and if the if the individual is fulfilled, then culture's enriched, as opposed to saying here's the Here's the Weasley architect, you know, uh, Peter Keating, and here's the hero architect, Howard Rourke, and of course the Weasel architect, you know, is you know, is got no ethics, no morals, and his buildings are awful. And here's the hero architect, and he will blow up the Weasel architect's interpretation of his work. I mean, to make it into morality play is 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 not the best way to communicate political ideas. And and you could make a case that that book did more to sort of undermine the public perception of what architects could be than any other book imaginable. Because the guy who listened and thought about things, Peter Keating, was a hack and a schlub. The guy who didn't listen to anything except his own genius was the hero and the and the, and the guy you want to venerate. So it yes. took it took a profession and slid it off into these two these two extremes again. Instead of saying, you know, you can be Howard Rourke and be Peter Keating at the same time. But that's not what people want to hear. They want to. They want. They want to, People want to think about things as red state, blue state. Yes. Think about things of of fundamentally believing in God or God doesn't exist, and if you believe in God, you're 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 brain dead. And there's no ambiguity that's tolerated much in culture anymore. And but if you look at the way we live, 98 percent of where we live is ambiguous. It's not white or black. It's somewhere yes. in between. Yes, it's shades. Oh, I just lost you there. <laughs> but it's shades of it's shades of gray. So you are writing, and I read your blog, and I really find it fascinating. Are you, you just doing that for just I don't know, just share your thoughts? And well, it's a weird scenario. It too. Weird. I was asked to write it. I was asked to write it by the local newspaper where I'm the architecture critic. Okay. So basically, they said, "Duo, why don't you be part of this group of people that write?" So I did that, and then I basically realized that. Um, since I write for I think four blogs for small amounts of money, but the only reason I think that I'm I well not the only reason a reason that I am kind of in the mix when people think about oh, do you want somebody to write about this building, my name comes up is because every week or two I put some blog posts out there. Now I put every day I do a little tweet that usually refers back to a blog post. So the problem is that you know even at 58 I'm sort of drawn into this culture of immediacy. And what's what's really sad about it is, and it's just true. You know, I, I write for a local magazine called New Haven Magazine. I write for the New Haven Register. I write for um, House Plans LLC. I write a little bit for House, and I write for um, uh, uh, Architecture Boston. So I write for these five or six different periodicals, and across the board, across the board, there are no editors. So everything I write, I've got to be the editor of. And sometimes the mangled prose that results and terrible grammar has made some of my best friends say, "Don't you have any quality control at all?" And it's true. And so that immediacy of being able to like, I wrote something today, yesterday, about the huge bridge construction that's happening in New Haven, and I was it'll be a blog post probably tomorrow or Monday or Tuesday, and it will also be uh, probably in the New Haven Register, and I wrote it. In about two hours, I think it's I think it's extremely cool. I love the way I love the way it expressed something that was been in my mind for about a year. But I had I had to do all the research myself, and I'm not totally sure that I dotted every I and crossed every T. It's not like I was going to die, but maybe I said something was 16 years in in creation, but maybe it's 17 or 13. But I looked at a couple block sites, and I said, well, I guess that's what it is, and I just didn't have the time to, you know. Ten years ago, when I was running for Money Magazine, basically there'd be three editors. There was a there was my editor, there was a copy editor, and then there was a fact checker. And you got your work got vetted three times before it got printed. Now it's me, and it gets printed. Nothing mm -hmm. gets done. Before. And that basically, I think, also encourages extremism. That also encourages, you know, 
unalloyed, off the cuff, you know, uh, you know, radical ideas, and because you know, other perspectives make your writing better. So right now, I'm writing a long piece for the Berkeley um, School of Architecture's um, pre periodical, and I forced what I write into the hands of three people that I respect because there's no editors there either. Mm -hmm. It's going to be too important for me not to basic and, and and a woman that's right that's sort of co-authoring with me that really could have is my helper. She basically found out that I got the name of an architect completely wrong because <laughs> it was on one site. I didn't vet it out. She vetted out to two other sites, and the other two sites proved that the one site that I looked at was wrong. So at some point, some large decisions are going to get made based on this faulty information, and we're going to basically be looking at the you know the internet as something which has a lot of liabilities as a, as, a, as a lot of good things about it as well. So, are you ever afraid to sort of really state your true views about something? Oh, well, I think basically, if you read the blog, you know that like I believe in God. You, you <laughs> basically, you basically, you basically know that I I essentially um, think of government as being something which um, has a lot of good intentions but can really screw things up. I think you never will know who I vote for. Um, but you also know essentially that I think that uh, the self um, the self perpetuating myth that uh, that is in my generation, the boomer generation, that we invented parenting and that we invented um, we you know and we invented uh, having a multitasking life and that we kind of invented uh, having you know spirituality infusing with our ethics. I mean, this incredibly narcissistic me generation sort of mindset that isn't going to die until the last boomer draws his last breath. All those things um, are part of the are, are part of you'll see in the in the blog if you read it about my belief system, which is essentially you know an enlightened humanist thing that accepts a lot of things as being legitimate and and doesn't say that that people that believe in a certain way are genetically flawed. You know, so. Well, you know, I, I sort of wanted to finish on, I had read your, um, you asked that question why in one of your blog posts, and are you saying that as a society you don't think we're asking it enough? You sort of end it with, you feel lucky and blessed about your life, and Ooh, I, say that I sort of echoed your feeling at the end, you said something like, um, which I feel a lot, like, I always say to God, thank you, and then I'm like, but somehow I still feel this, um, I don't know, thank you just seems, I still feel like I'm in this void, or I feel a fear, I, I feel the grace of God, but I still feel like there's like, what after that? I still have these lingering questions, sometimes even a melancholy. What do you think about the question, why? What did you mean by that? Well, it is the last, it is the most important question, and it's the first question <laughs> a two-year-old asks, and it's the question that gets asked the least. We're asking how much, what is that, how do I do this? Almost never do you say, well, why do I like this, or why am I afraid of that? Mm. And it's the most important question, because it's a, it, but the problem is, now we know enough, if you look at science, and many of my friends are really wonderful, world-class scientists. If you actually um, think about what and science and actually theology are the only two professions where you make money out of saying the word why. You basically earn your living by saying, well, why does the Higgs boson particle not show up over here, but maybe it shows up over here, or you say if you're, in, you know, if you're a priest, or a cleric, you say, well, why is there evil in the heart of men, and well, how does go, well, how can you have an all-powerful, uh, you know, all-powerful, perfectly good God that created all of us allow you know the Nazis to kill six million Jews and six million other people? Well, you could make all those. Those are the only two professions that are are, are the why professions. Right. But the truth, but the truth is, what's hardest now is that we all know enough to know what we don't know. I mean. Donald Rumsfeld had, you know, whatever you think of him politically, had one of the great syllogisms I've ever heard anybody say. You know, there are known knowns, unknown knowns, and unknown unknowns. Well, you know, in human history, there were so many unknown unknowns 
that you could basically, you know, go to church and you think you've covered all your bases. And you could just go, you know, plow the field, eat the food, have some children, die of some disease that you had no idea what it was, and your <laughs> life was circumscribed to this very unknown, unknown world that was, you know, about love and family and faith and food and sleep and then death. The problem is that, you know, for the last few hundred years, as science has not only gotten more inclusive of, of lots of facts, it's also become aware of what it doesn't know. I mean, one of my very best friends is a world-class, one of the all-time great um, a particle physicists. And his daughter is my goddaughter. And we, we have many different conversations about the hilarity, and he gets kind of miffed maybe, I think, but he, of the hilarity of the fact that a guy named Zwicky had to come up in 1930s with, with some way to fudge the fact that we can only see a small percentage of the matter in the universe. We only can see, Then he thought we could see maybe 80% of it. Well, the latest thing that came out this year was we, can, we, can, we, uh, we can't see 80% of it. Right now, we, we can kind of quantify less than 5% of the material matter in the universe in terms of what we, what we can measure in cosmology. That means that over 90% of everything is a known unknown. So we've sort of opened the box, see all this stuff we never saw before, and we don't know what the heck it is or why it's there or what it's doing. So the why question becomes even crazier because we now know that there's all this stuff we don't know. Right. So why, why, why is that there? Why isn't you know, why? So my sense is that you know when I when I the only time I'm ever really truly happy is when I'm completely exhausted. So I'm completely exhausted. I'm too tired to ask why. I just I can just basically say thanks. So I I think we're at a strange place where you know we're well fed. We live a long life. Typically, you know, we dissociate work from our families. We're in this place where we can ask more questions than we've ever been able to ask. We have more answers to more questions than we've ever had ever because of science. And yet we also know there is so much knowledge that we have, we're clueless about that we're kind of caught in a world where there are so many more whys than there have ever been. You know, so... So to me, it's the biggest question. It's the hardest one to deal with, and it's the one that is the most frustrating because you know, we we we've now measured gravity to be subatomic in nature, to just the most gravity and it's all of its different manifestations is all the way down to we drill down to all the different ways gravity can 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 deal with matter and and everything, and yet when I ask my science friends, so what's gravity again? They have this incredible blank look on their face. Well, it's a measurable phenomenon. <laughs> what is gravity again? Well, it's you know it's a, it's the result of mass. Well, what is it? It's a force. Well, what is it? They don't know. So, when something that fundamental is if fundamentally unknown, and yet you know that it's unknown, it, it it's kind of disturbing to the corpus human. I mean, I I you know it would be nicer to be more ignorant or more knowledgeable than we are now. Right. That's really, that's, uh, that's, <laughs> I don't know, you said it so well. Um, I totally agree. I mean, the same thing about a black hole. I mean, you can ask people, I had I have a friend who's a physicist too, and I was like, well, what's a black hole? I mean, there's theories about so many things, and they have their theories that until they're not proven, I guess that's a theory, until they can prove something else. I. But yet, people can actually say that they don't, they can believe in a black hole, they know it exists, but they don't believe in God. I always sort of find that fascinating. Well, um, well what I find unbelievable is that most of, and I have some very, very dear atheist friends too, really people that I, too, I, love, I love with all my heart that are complete atheists. What I find really humorous is that they think about every data point, everything they can measure, everything that's tangible, and yet, there's seven billion people on the earth, and over five billion of them believe that there's something greater than themselves in the universe. So those aren't data points why? So those aren't facts why? So those are those are facts with an asterisk because they're illegitimate because why? 
So the, the, the point is that, you know, any time that an architect stops, stops thinking that his building exists in the environment, any time that a doctor ceases to think that the disease he's treating isn't part of a human being, any time that a scientist doesn't understand that what constitutes the human mind and this weird illogical sense of morality isn't data and isn't science, you basically are separating the cause and effect of every of, of things and you know life doesn't let you separate cause and effect. Cause and effect are like that. So an architect thinks about a building a certain way, the cause of his mindset creates the effect of the building. So when a scientist thinks in a way that says, well, there is no such thing as God because God is immeasurable, and then you say, well, so is, you know, gravity is measurable, but what's gravity? It, you're not like saying that you know, dinosaurs roamed the Earth 5,000 years ago. What you're saying is there's a lot of shit we, sorry, there's a lot of stuff we don't know. Right. And when there's a lot of stuff you don't know, you shouldn't say that the stuff that you think you know, that you really don't know, is the better fact than my stuff that I don't know. No, for right. sure. Exactly. No, that's that's. <laughs> I totally agree with you. So I sort of just go that there's a lot of it that's a mystery, and I sort yeah. of trust my intuitive sense that the mystery is a part of humanity. I mean, yeah. I that that's that's where I go with that. Now I can't let you leave because Bill asked me to ask you, if you one question, which I might edit out, but I have to ask you do it. I have to <laughs> I'm like, glad it's edited. Oh. I used to He's like, don't let Duo go until you ask him if he thinks the pot should be legalized. I'm such a mixed brain on this. Yeah, I've you? never smoked anything. I mean, anything. Right. And at the same time, you know, I wrote a piece right you after. You haven't smoked um, a pipe. You, know, you haven't smoked a pipe, you a make cigarette, me, nothing. I'm anything. I've never okay. put any smoke of any kind in my life. Okay. And it's not because I, I think I'm a better person. I just, to me, it's like. You know, I've, I've never owned a gun either. I, I've never. There are things that I just I, I can't even imagine why you'd ever want to do that for any reason. It's just like, why would you even think about that? But that's whatever you want to do is fine. But when I think about dope, especially weed, when I think about that, when I think about alcohol, I wrote a I wrote a piece um, right after uh, the Newtown killings. It was called Prohibition. It's on the blog. It's called Prohibition. Okay. And basically, it says, you know, I'm a I'm a, a child of an alcoholic. I basically know really how horrific alcohol can destroy people's lives, can take families and just wreck everyone in the family. It's, it's wrecked my family, it wrecked any number of families. So alcohol is a nightmare. It's also pleasant. It also enhances food. It's also part of our culture. It's also used by 95% of the people who use it in an extremely benign way. Well, that they tried because because of the horrible horrible aspects of how alcohol um, really was infused in American culture in the 19th and 20th century. I mean, they would have they would have bottles of alcohol on judges' desks during trials. You know, they would actually be drinking during trials because you know, it was part of what everything. They had alcohol all over the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives. People were just drinking, so all the time. They prohibited it. So they really prohibited it. They said, this is the right thing to do. And you know, if you look at it really coldly, you're like, why do we need alcohol? Let's prohibit it. And it didn't stop one person from drinking at all. It just made my, my father made beer in the attic of the, his house in Ithaca that I ended up renting the same apartment with 40 years after he got out of school. So, I mean, people will want to drink. People will want to do stupid things. And the question is, at what point does society end up saying it's worth the effort to try to head it off the pass? Now, clearly, millions and millions of people think that weed and dope is just fine. It's part of everybody's life, and it's all good. The one thing I do find about marijuana, and a lot of other drugs, but really marijuana in particular, is that I find it sad. I find, I find the need to alter your state sad. It means that what you have now is irredeemably boring or, or painful and you can't deal with it in the here and now. You can have a glass of wine and have zero effects of alcohol. You can have two and a half cocktails at the bar that we go to too often in New Haven and have a little bit of an effect but really nothing that would, would prevent you from driving safely or, or anything. It's, but, but you don't drink 
I don't anymore drink to get drunk like I did in college. But pretty much everybody that tokes up isn't doing it because he loves the taste of the dope. He isn't doing it because having, you know, smoking dope with a meal enhances the meal. They're doing it because they want an altered state of their mind. So that when, so that the idea of, of sort of saying it, it's, it, that life here on earth is inadequate without altering the way you perceive it, I just feel sad about that. But I don't think it's, I mean, the reality is whether it's legal or not, it doesn't matter. Every, you know, zillions of people are going to use it. So the question is, is it throwing people in jail about it, is that, is that a worthwhile consequence of culture? I don't know. I do know that a lot of kids do a lot of stupid things. So at least for kids, we have to stop them from at easy access to stupid things. And that could even just be like riding bicycles without helmets. I mean, that's a stupid thing. So yeah. anyway, that's how I feel about Toby. You know, I feel sad about it too for that same reason, about the, that like something is inadequate about that moment and something yeah. you need to have like this altered experience. And I guess to that, I would probably ask that question, why? Or why do you have that? What is it that's missing, I guess? Yeah. I'm, I'm sort of fascinated by that question and why people want to use for those reasons any drug, not just marijuana, yeah. any, any sort of. Well, some people use alcohol. sex for that reason too. You know, it's sex. It can even be compulsive exercise. There are a lot of ways people are extreme about things because the lack of extremity makes them feel they're missing something, and and that's that's part of the human condition. I mean, sometimes when I'm writing, I will write way, 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 way over on something, and I will come back to it. And I say, well, that's not about you weren't expressing the topic. You were expressing dissatisfaction in your understanding of the topic and you write 3,000 words and you should write 300 words. Well, I have the ability to edit that out. You know, I can't unsmoke a joint. So it's sort of like <laughs> one, one, once you go over that Rubicon, you basically are saying that's, that's where I want to be. I want to be on that side of life that needs that enhancement and that subculture. I just am not there. I just never have been. And I, you know, I was in college in this, in the, Late, uh, you know, in the, in the 70s, and everybody was smoking dope all around me all the time. I never, they never treated me any differently because I didn't. So, and I don't think either of my kids have smoked dope or even done a, done a lot of drinking, unlike their father. And um, and they seem to be fine too. And I I I think there's almost a genetic quality of people that seemingly really need to have that level of ecstatic distortion and people that would prefer to be dumber and more grinding about things and I tend to be dumber and more grinding and less in need of ecstatic transformation like going to a fundamentalist church and holding snakes and things so that's not part of who I am. I, I share your grinding it out sort of dumb and okay well with that I'm really happy that you gave me your time. It means a lot to well, me. It's a pleasure. It really was wonderful to be with you. Thank you, everyone who's going to see this. Um, this is Annette Ross with Common Ground on the Sylvia Global Media Network. Thank you, Dua Dickinson. You are lovely. And Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.